the Division of Education, Innovation and Energy welcomes you to its e-learning program. I'm your biology teacher, Lynetta Cobby-Clark, and today we'll be looking at part one of a two-part series on transport in plants and animals. Components of blood. What are the different things that make up your blood? Now, I remember when I was in standard three and our teacher at that time, Miss Solomon, she came in and she started the class by saying that our blood is not red. Of course, we were scandalized. We're in standard three. And we're like, how can she say our blood is not red? But she laid the foundation for what I now understand, or we now mostly understand, of what our blood is really made of. So our blood is not really red. Our blood is actually made up mainly of this substance here called plasma. Plasma is a pale yellowish liquid that, is, that contains all the dissolved substances that are in the blood. So your components of blood, you have plasma, which makes up most of your blood. Then you have white blood cells, also known as leukocytes. You have red blood cells, also known as erythrocytes. And you have platelets, also known as thrombocytes. You need to be able to use the terminologies um, as you go along. So if you take a vial of blood and you centrifuge it, and you spin it very fast, it's going to separate into this dab and what you're seeing here, just like this every single time it would feel. So more than half of your blood is made up of this pale yellow substance here called plasma. And then the rest of your blood is your blood cells. And the reason your blood looks red is because of this cell here, which um, has a specific substance called hemoglobin. When hemoglobin combines with your oxygen, it turns a nice bright red. So if you were to remove blood cells from your blood, your blood will no longer look red. It will have this pale yellow substance, pale yellow color because of your plasma. Okay, so types of blood cells, like I said, you have red blood cells, your erythrocytes, whose function is to help in the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. You have your platelets, who have a very important function in blood clotting. And then you have your white blood cells, your leukocytes, whose job is primarily to fight against infections. So if you were to look at a smear under a microscope, this is what you will generally see. Most of the blood smear will contain your erythrocytes. So these pale pink dots that you're seeing here, these are your erythrocytes or your red blood cells. Then you may see some other blood cells here. These are the ones which are your white blood cells and you have different types and how do you tell the white blood cells from the red blood cells the presence of the nucleus here so most of your white blood cells have this lobed you see the bumps this lobed nucleus or nuclei so these are your white blood cells here and your red blood cells have no nucleus and then you may see some little fragments of blood of, of blood cells these little fragments here these are your platelets. So this is a typical blood smear and you may see possible questions asking you to identify different types of blood in a blood, different types of blood cells rather in your blood smear. So let us focus on red blood cells really, really quickly. So your red blood cells have a large surface area, of course the volume ratio. They contain a substance called hemoglobin. So without getting into it in too much detail, here you have a red blood cell, and on the inside of your blood cell, you have this structure, which we know is called hemoglobin. So with really four chains, and that hemoglobin carries your oxygen. There's the hemoglobin that carries your oxygen. And when your hemoglobin combines with the oxygen, like I said, that is what turns it into the nice bright red that we know as the color of blood. So it has no nucleus. 
Because it doesn't have a nucleus, it can therefore pack this hemoglobin structure, which we write as Hb, it can pack the hemoglobin into the entire cell because there's no nucleus. Now, because there's no nucleus, your red blood cells do not live very long, normally about three months. So your body has to keep making red blood cells constantly because there is no nucleus. Right? The function of the red blood cells is to carry oxygen from the lungs, carry oxygen from the lungs to the body, and carbon dioxide from the body to the lungs. So when it gives up its oxygen in the um in the organ, it will take up carbon dioxide, go to the heart, then to the lungs, exchange that carbon dioxide for oxygen, and then the cycle begins all over again. Okay, let us look now at platelets. These are the ones which help you to clot your blood. I know every one of us would have had some sort of cut. You fell off a bag, you, you cut yourself with a knife, and then you would bleed. Now when you imagine that this is a blood vessel and you're seeing red blood cells here, you're seeing red blood cells and you're also seeing platelets. So when you cut yourself, obviously, platelets and red blood cells are going to flow out through the broken blood vessel. So you'll call that bleeding. Now, when these platelets are exposed to oxygen, that is when they are activated. So they are activated by exposure to oxygen and they start to clump together. So you're going to have the platelets clumping together here and forming what is known as a platelet plug. Forming a platelet plug. And there's a series of reactions that take place after where calcium ions are involved and you have the activation of a substance called fibri of a substance called fibrinogen fibrinogen which is converted to fibrin fibrin is insoluble and it makes up these um sort of wiry looking structures here, that is your clot. So by forming this fibrin um, plug or the clot over the broken vessel, you, you essentially block or prevent more blood cells from getting out. And most importantly, you prevent bacteria from getting in. So this is the first stage in the healing process. I've know, I know that most of you would have picked up some scabs on your cut. You'll find this thread-like um, substance on the scab. And when you pick it apart, you may have bleeding again because you would have broken up that fibrin, that insoluble barrier, and caused red blood cells to leak out again. So platelets are very instrumental in forming blood clots to prevent further bleeding one and most importantly to prevent bacteria and other pathogens from entering into your bloodstream. Now let us look at leukocytes. These are your white blood cells and these are your um, fighters against diseases. Now you have two main actions that you need to know about. The first one are your phagocytes. These white blood cells are the ones which more or less eat or destroy the bacteria or whatever foreign material would have entered into your body. So we're using a bacteria here, for example, but it can be any foreign um, substance, a virus, a fungus, anything. And your white blood cells operate like amoeba. They go around the bacteria basically engulfing it here and then they are going to be digested by the bacteria so basically they are going to be destroyed by these phagocytes so they are phagocytes 
or they undergo phagocytosis where they engulf the bacteria using their false arms. So they entrap it and then substances within the bacteria are going to destroy the, sub, sorry, substances within the, the, the blood cell, the white blood cell are going to destroy the bacteria, basically rendering it ineffective or destroy any foreign matter as a matter of fact. So these are one type of white blood cells, and this is how they operate, by phagocytosis, engulfing the bacteria and destroying it. The other type of white blood cell that defends your body against diseases are these lymphocytes. These do not engulf the foreign matter or the pathogen. What they do is that they produce antibodies, which is another form of attack against foreign invading material into the body. So your antibodies are very specific. So here are your antibodies in this particular example. And these antibodies are going to bind with the pathogen. So here are the bacteria molecules or whatever pathogen it is. Like I said, it could be a virus as well. It can be a virus, it can be a fungus, anything strange to the body. And what they do, they would bind them or cause them to aggregate. So here's your antibodies. This is the antibody, and they are binding the foreign matter, the bacteria, the virus, and cause them to clump together. Then this is going to encourage the phagocytes now to come and engulf and destroy that particular foreign matter. So like I said, we have two major functioning. We have those which just generally engulf um, your foreign matter and those which produce antibodies that are very specific to one particular um, antigen. So one antibody to one antigen. So every single foreign matter would have to have its own antibodies. Your body will have to make antibodies to deal with that specific antigen. Okay, so immunity is your body's ability to fight off an infection. So in here about whether your immunity is high or immunity is low. Your immunity is your body's ability to fight an infection. So we have two main types of immunity. It can be natural immunity, meaning from within the system, or it can be artificial, something sort of man-made. So under natural immunity, we have active, and active is what I would have described before, where your body would have made antibodies to fight off a particular infection. So for example, you, um, your body got invaded with chickenpox vi um, virus, your body will make chickenpox antibodies, for want of a better word, and then those antibodies are going to fight off that particular infection. So it is your body doing the work. Then you have passive natural, which is the type of immunity that you will get from your mother. So your mother's antibodies are going to pass to you in the womb. So if your mother, got chickenpox before she has the antibodies then you will have temporary immunity against chickenpox because it would have passed across the placenta to you so when you are born you have temporary passive immunity which is all natural because it would have come across from your mother to you and then you have artificial immunity which is something synthesized, not really natural, not what your body would have made. So you have passive artificial, where the antibodies themselves, which would have been synthesized in a lab, those would be introduced into your system, you know, a shot, and your body will then now start using those antibodies as a defense against a particular disease. And then you have active um, artificial, where a weak or dead form of a virus or bacteria is introduced into your system, which we call vaccination, 
and your body is going to do what it normally does and it's going to create antibodies for that um, bacteria or some invading pathogen that has been introduced into you and your body will make antibodies to deal with it. So you would have gotten vaccinated against a specific disease. So let's go again. Natural immunity, we have both passive and active. Active when your body makes the antibody and passive when it is passed from your mother to you. Both are natural and artificial where either the antibodies introduced into your system or a weak or deadened form of the virus or bacteria is introduced, vaccination, and your body makes the antibodies to deal with it. So when you are vaccinated against, um, let us say, measles, you are going to be introduced to, this, to, the, to the virus or whatever bacteria it is, and your body will make antibodies. These antibodies will lie dormant. So I would have talked about active immunity, um, where your body makes antibodies, most of the time, your body will use some of that and those antibodies as memory antibodies. So not all of them are going to be used to deal with the virus. Some will remain in your system floating around. So the next time you come into contact with that particular virus or bacteria, your body will respond faster. So we have this whole talk about immunity to um, the coronavirus. Because it is so new, we don't know. But theory dictates that if you have been exposed to it and your body created antibodies, some of the antibodies will stay in your system. So if you are introduced to the street coronavirus again in the future, your body will have a quicker and more effective response to dealing with it in the future because of those memory antibodies which remained in the system. And now that is theory. Okay, so we have more or less gone through circulation in humans, transporting humans. So let's look at some past paper questions quickly to make sure you understood the topic. So first question, which blood cell transports oxygen and carbon dioxide around the body? Is it one, two, three, or four? Yes, it is your red blood cell. So the answer here is A. Platelets are represented by one, two, three, or four. Your platelets are these small fragments of cells, so the answer here is B. Which of the following are characteristics of red blood cells in mammals? One, they contain hemoglobin. Two, they have lobed nucleus. Three, they are made in the bone marrow. And four, they destroy invading germs. Which of these are correct? So let's go through them. Do they contain hemoglobin? So we're looking at red blood cells. Yes, they contain hemoglobin. Do they have a lobe nucleus? No, they have no nucleus. Are they made in the bone marrow? Yes, they are. And do they destroy invading germs? No, they don't. So our answer here must be one and three. And the only option here with one and three is C. So the answer here is C. Large organisms cannot depend solely on diffusion for the uptake and transport of gases. This is because as organisms get larger, the A, surface area to volume ratio increases, surface area to volume ratio decreases, Surface area to volume both increase and surface area to the volume both decrease. This is the one we did with the boxes or the cubes. So the answer is as the organism gets larger, the surface area to volume ratio will decrease. You would have more volume than surface. Which blood vessel contains valves along their length? Are, or blood vessels which contain valves along their length are, so you have blood vessel R coming from the head, blood vessel S going towards the heart, blood vessel T going from the liver to the heart, U which is here, Q which is over here, and P. So P and Q are coming from the heart and all the others are going towards the heart except R which is coming from the heart. 
So which blood vessels contain valves? Now we know that veins contain valves because they prevent the backflow of blood as they go towards the heart. Because remember, the veins are not carrying blood under high pressure. They are carrying blood under relatively low pressure. So to prevent the blood from flowing backwards, you have to have valves to keep them from falling down. So which ones contain valves? Let's look at P. P is an artery, so we know the answer cannot be A. R and T. R here is carrying blood back to the heart, which is true. So it's back to the heart and T, which is going to the heart. However, R is coming from the head, so it's coming from a very um, short distance to the heart. So let us see what the other options are. S and Q. So S is here, it's coming blood to the heart, so it must have valves. But Q is an artery, it's coming from the heart, so it will not have valves. So that is not correct. And S and U. You have S again and U, which is carrying blood to the heart. So the best answer here is D, S and U. Now, why I did not choose R is because the distance from the head to the heart, it is, it is naturally full, flowing down towards the heart. So there's no need for valves in this example. So the answer here is S and U. Okay, so let's look at the other question. What is the name of the chamber labeled three? Here, the left atrium, right atrium, left ventricle, or right ventricle. So we know definitely it's an atrium, it's one of the upper chambers, and it will be your left atrium. Remember that it is flip side if you're looking at it from the diagram. What kind of blood enters the chamber at six here? Is it oxygenated blood from the lungs? Deoxygenated blood from the lungs, oxygenated blood from the body, or deoxygenated blood from the body. So here we have the superior vena cava, which is going into this atria here. So it has to be deoxygenated blood from the body. Which chamber pumps blood through the pulmonary artery? So the pulmonary artery would be the one leaving the heart going towards the lung. So it has to be leaving the heart going towards the lungs. So this is the one here and that would be E, number one. So this is one of your um, short answer questions. Maria carried out an experiment to investigate the effect of exercise on her heart rate. She measured her heart rate after each of the following activities and documented her results in the table below. So she stood still for five minutes, then she checked her heart rate. She walked steadily around the room for five minutes, then checked her heart rate. And then she ran around the playing field for five minutes and checked her heart rate. So these are her heart rate numbers here after each activity. And the question asks, Suggest why Maya's heart beat increased when she exercised. Okay, and so you will have to talk about things like when you exercise, there's an increased demand for oxygen in your cells. So you would have to have an increased heart rate to cause more blood to pump at a faster rate from your heart to the, um, the exercising organ, which would be by your legs or what have you. So you need to talk about things like that in your response. Increased need for oxygen, increased heart rate, which would pump more blood at a faster rate to get that oxygen to the exercising muscles as well as to remove carbon dioxide quickly from those cells to your heart for that gaseous exchange in your lungs. So you need to mention all of those things for your full three marks. It's a three marks question. Your sister Amber had chicken pox when she was a child and is now immune to the disease. Explain how this immunity came about. So for four marks, 
what are you going to talk about? So you must mention words like active natural immunity. You must talk about your memory antibodies, which would have been created after the, the in original antibodies would have dealt with the infection. And of course, you must talk about the phagocytes, which would deal with the chickenpox vaccine after your body would have created antibodies. So these memory antibodies are going to give her permanent immunity against chickenpox in the future. So mention all of those, explain yourself well, and you'll get your full four marks. Humans have a double circulatory system. Explain what this means and why is it necessary in humans for five marks. So what must you mention? You must talk about deoxygenated versus oxygenated blood. You must talk about the first pass in the heart is to push the blood towards the lungs. And we know what happens in the lungs. The blood gets oxygenated. And then you talk about the second pass, which is from your heart to the rest of your body. You should also talk about why can't it go straight from your lungs to your body? Because the lungs cannot pump. So it is your heart, which is made up of cardiac muscles, which push that blood, give it the force, so that it can go from your heart all the way, even to your extremities. So you must mention these things, explain yourself well for your full five marks. Of course, you will talk about the need because we have a large um, smaller surface area to volume ratio, you will talk about the need for a transport, an effective transport system in multicellular organisms. Okay, so I will leave you with these questions that you would attempt on your own. So if you're watching this cast on a, on a location where you can pause, then you can work on these on your own. Please stay tuned for other broadcasts from the Division of Education, Innovation and Energy e-learning program. Stay blessed, stay safe. Thanks again.